You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagoya Dillin and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Body Banter. My name is Shagun Yedele, and I'm call, call, calling in, coming to you from Kelowna, which is in the traditional, unceded, and ancestral territories of the Silks Okanagan Nation. As usual, today I have with me my co anchor, <laughs> Claudia. It's the first time you've called me your co-anchor. That's wonderful. My name's Claudia Krebs. I'm joining you from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation, also known as the UBC Vancouver campus. I am so thrilled to have this guest with us today. So I met Ben at a conference in the spring of 2022, um, where he was talking about his lived experience as a trans medical student. Ben, welcome to Body Banter. I'm glad to be here. Thank you all for inviting me. Can you give us a quick summary of who you are? Yeah, so my name is Ben Hassin. My pronouns are he, him. I am a fourth year medical student in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, The ancestral land is Muskogee. And um, I started medical transitioning, uh, medically transitioning in my first year of medical school. Uh, I've known I was trans for a very, very long time. But it wasn't until I got into medical school that I decided to start taking hormones to transition. And uh, funny enough, I took my first shot of testosterone a week after my white coat ceremony. So um, my classmates got to see me in the last four years transition. And it's been a pretty eye opening experience for them because, yes, they have trans patients, but they've never really seen people transition right in front of their eyes. And they come to me all the time about how much of an impact it's had on them. And they know about the struggles that I went through during my time in medical school. So that um, during my time transitioning, I realized that there are so many health disparities for trans people, especially for trans people of color. I am South Asian and I'm a trans person. So I have multiple intersectional identities. And I just started talking about what it's been like as a transgender medical student and what it's been like to also be a patient. So I have two different lenses when I do my advocacy work, one as a healthcare worker and two as a trans patient myself. Thank you, Ben. And that's, oh, go ahead, Shagan. Go go right ahead. I was just going to say that sounds so wonderful and fascinating and um I'm just wondering, because you said this looks new to your fellow students and, you know, where they saw you transition right in front of their eyes. What about some of those common things that they will tell you about the impact it's had on them? Uh, The first thing is that um, they got used to using pronouns. (laughs) And uh, for um, a place like Southern Georgia, sometimes it's hard for people to adjust to a new concept or something new that they've never seen before. And um, for a lot of my classmates, yeah, yes, they've made mistakes when it came to adjusting me in the beginning, but eventually they got it right. And I'm really grateful in a way, in a sense, um, because they, um, they were able to adjust their behaviors for me so that if they were to have a trans patient who is in a lot less privileged position than I am, they'll be able to respect their pronouns without, you know, having any setbacks or hiccups. It's really important to talk about these outward signs like pronouns and the respect that that brings to the person. Um, And I'm really impressed with your um, openness and vulnerability uh, towards your fellow students of sort of sharing your experience with them and helping your whole class grow and through your advocacy on social media and YouTube, really being a role model for a lot of folks out there who are seeking role models that they can uh, speak to. I watched your video clip where you talked about your decision about not going stealth. Um, 
and how much it meant to you that you were that role model, that you could be that lived experience people could look up and then look up to. Um, tell us a little bit more about that advocacy piece. Yeah, so uh, when I decided to not go stealth, it was it kind of had mixed reviews with my family because uh, my family eventually came to accept me and they love me for who I am. But even to this day, they're very scared uh, of my safety because of how out and proud I am about being trans. I mean, my mom talks to me all the time about how she sometimes has nightmares where I'm in danger. Um, but the reason why I choose to be visible is because I've had so many people in the last two to three years who message me on Instagram and Twitter and tell me that, you know, hey, I'm a trans person and I really, really want to pursue a healthcare career, but I don't know if I'll be accepted and you give me inspiration to pursue that. And I think in the last year, there was, there's a story that one of my colleagues told me that really touched me a lot. And it was my colleague was doing her psychiatry rotation at an inpatient child psychiatric facility. And um, my colleague had a patient, a young trans kid. And um, when, when, the, when the patient found out that my colleague went to Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, the patient asked, do you know Ben, like Ben Hassin? And uh, my colleague was like, yeah, he's my he's my classmate. And he was like, oh, my God, I love Ben. Uh, I really look up to him. And I've never seen this patient before. And just knowing that, like, I'm making such an impact on people and inspiring people to be great themselves, is it, it means the world to me. What a beautiful story that gave me goosebumps. And I keep on interrupting Shagan today. So Shagan, go ahead. I apologize. I, I'm the one in, um, interrupting. I was just wondering as a medical professional uh, in this, you know, you must have a very unique insight into, into what it means to, to transition. And uh, because look at us this is a body banter podcast we are anatomists that's really a very big foundation of, of medicine and so what have you observed in terms of the way we practice medicine or the way we teach anatomy uh, we teach about the human body that you feel needs to change needs to accommodate more trans people I think my biggest issue with medical education and how medicine is practiced right now is this idea of normalization that everything has to be normal, which is not really how people live their lives. Uh, most people are not normal. Most people have chronic illness. Most people have one kidney. Well, not most people, I'll say there's some people uh, who have one kidney. And uh, when I was in my anatomy class, something that really made a lot of sense to me is one of my professors says you have to appreciate every individual difference in the bodies that we examine. And I wish that could be attributed to all of medicine because so much of medicine is trying to fix something that doesn't really need to be fixed. Oh my gosh, Ben, you're touching upon a theme that has come up again and again in our conversations throughout this podcast, how um, the normalization of the what we call the white crossfit guy as sort of the stand-in for all of humans is really weird because nobody is that guy um and and yet in our illustrations and everywhere that's what we what we aspire to almost um so thank you for uh, that quote from your anatomy teacher about appreciating the differences i think that should be um maybe the tagline for medical schools right like so-and-so medical school, we appreciate the differences. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, having gone through transition and having lived in a transgender body before transition, you have a really unique perspective on what living in a human body is like as you've watched your body change. Um I would love to hear a little bit about that, what your relationship with your body has been and is. Yeah, so one, one big thing for me that I realized over time is my connection to my chest. Uh, when I was young and little, um, I had so much dysphoria, I almost lost feeling like 
I know I could feel things, but I conceptually and f- mentally lost feeling of my chest because it was so dysphoric and traumatizing for me. And then after I got top surgery, um, I was numb for a very, very long time because you know, I had to re- reestablish the nerve connections that were you know uh, cut and then had to uh, regain itself. But uh, I remember when I first started having feeling on my chest again, it was just so, so intense. And that's because in my mind, I was trying to ignore those feelings. And now that I've come to accept myself and I like the way that I look in the mirror, every all my sensations are like times 100 and just looking at my chest now and you know looking at myself in the mirror even with clothes on it just makes me feel like who I am back when I was younger I hated looking at the mirror I hated taking pictures everything that I saw did not look like what I felt like on the inside thank you so much for sharing that um and and uh, and I'm sure your experience is, even though it's it's unique, I, I I would not want to say that it's typical because that's exactly what we're saying, that people are different and everyone is everyone is different. And I and I wonder how maybe um, in the community what you've heard about uh, the experiences of others, how similar that is to yours, or how different it might ha- it might have been to yours. Um, because I, I want to erase that from my mind or from the from our listeners that oh the way Ben has described his experience is how everyone what everyone goes through and so I'm wondering how what from your experience and from what you hear in the community what how different is this experience with different people? Yeah, I think it's really important for whenever you bring about bring a trans person to a speaking engagement or any form of like invitation for anything is not to assume that this one trans person represents all trans people. Like I say this a lot in my talks is that I'm not a monolith. I don't represent all trans experiences. And uh, one way is through how people feel gender dysphoria. Some trans people don't have gender dysphoria at all. Uh, They're very comfortable with their body, but they know that they're trans. Um, me, on the other hand, I had a lot of dysphoria when it came to my voice and my chest, but I don't really have bottom dysphoria. I don't desire to have any form of bottom surgery, while other trans people might have that desire and they might have that dysphoria. So every every person's experience with dysphoria or not even having dysphoria is unique to their own lived experience, uh, how they were raised. Um, one of my friends had very, very supportive parents ever since they were young, so uh, they don't feel the need to have any form of um, gen- gender affirming medical transition. They're, they've socially transitioned, but because they have had those foundations of a very supportive environment and family, they don't experience dysphoria the same way I do. Thank you. That's that's I believe that's something that people need to hear about how um, everyone is unique and everyone's experience is different and you cannot assume <laughs> that everybody is the same. Um, I want to kind of you know, move a little bit off tangent in the sense of experience in the community because you live in Georgia. Georgia is in the south of the United States. And, uh, and well, I've, 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 I've traveled to Georgia um, but I, I wonder what that experience is. I the, the typical uh, understanding that I have about Georgia and about the south of the United States is that people are pretty conservative in their mm-hmm. views. <laughs> uh, people are pretty, you know, uh, ho- you know, conservative. And so I'm wondering, did you get any pushback? Did you get any kind of um, things that are not that maybe you might like to speak about in terms of how accepting? Has the community, the general uh, population or ex- outside community been t- for you? So Georgia is interesting because uh, I think in the last election cycle, we finally turned blue, uh, which was a huge thing. And like it's been a couple of decades since we actually turned blue in the last election cycle. But uh, my experience in Georgia has been interesting. So I live in Atlanta, which is the biggest city uh, in the state of Georgia. And surprisingly enough, Atlanta has been very, very accepting. And there's a lot of trans people of color living here. So there's a study done by the Williams Institute at UCLA. 
And uh, they did a prediction in 2015. They tried to estimate the amount of trans people living in the U.S. And Georgia actually ranked number one for the uh, highest amount of black trans people living in the state. So um, there's a lot of misconceptions about living in the South. So I've lived in the South for nine years, uh, since I was nine years old. And I'm really passionate about uh, being a resident of the South because I think there's so much diversity that never gets talked about in, um, you know, in mass media, um, mostly the people who are very loud about their conservative opinions get media coverage for, uh, for Georgia. But there's just so much diversity here. There's an organization here called Southern Fried Queer Pride. It's a predominantly uh, people of color, queer based organization that like runs events like every month for uh, queer people of color. And I, I don't get to see this, this kind of community involvement uh, in other places. Thank you for that. It kind of drives home the point that the individual differences is what we need to look at and not look at a, a, an identity, whether it be a gender identity or whatever, as a monolith. And the same, I guess, we've just learned about Georgia. I'm so happy to hear about that because like Shagan, I, when I think about peaches, uh, peaches, there we go, Georgia, I think about peaches and I think about conservative folks. So <laughs> I am going to revisit that now. Thank you for that. Um, I want to go back to your lived experience um, because we, I want I love talking about the body and you know what the body means for us. Um, I always talk about how our human form defines us as, as humans and it defines our humanity. Um, I'll just ask a really direct question. What was your first injection of testosterone like? What were the first things you felt and and what happened? Yeah. So surprisingly, after the first day of getting my first shot, I started experiencing hot flashes and I was like, oh, my God, I'm experiencing experiencing symptoms of menopause, uh, which was um, I did not expect to feel those kinds of feelings. And then, you know, I expected immediately to grow a beard within the next two weeks and immediately to become a bodybuilder and be able to lift 200 pounds. But that didn't really happen. My voice started slightly dropping within the first month, but it took almost two entire years for it to completely get to the level of deepness that it is now. And another huge uh, surprising, uh, I don't want to be too TMI, but another huge surprising Thing that I experienced is within the first week, I experienced clitoromegaly, which I didn't expect for a while. That was one of the first changes I, I saw. And I talked to other transmasculine people about this and transmasculine friends, and they said the same thing, that they didn't expect to have that change that quickly compared to the other changes that they were uh, expecting. And um, I get a lot of praise for, you know, having a beard at this point in my transition. But I also really want to emphasize that, you know, not every trans masculine person will develop a beard if they start testosterone. I am gifted with, you know, South Asian genetics. So I've been able to grow a beard, but um, I do want uh, trans masculine people to be very, very realistic. If your whole family um, doesn't have beards, probably that you won't have those um, changes. So a lot of Yes, hormones do help, but a lot of it is also the genetics that is passed down to you. Thank you. That's uh, that's uh, I'm picking up some few acronyms myself. Uh, TMI. <laughs> 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 um, and so I want to ask about um, because you've spoken about how your family have been very supportive um, initially, of course they were concerned and up till today, they are concerned about you. How about your siblings? Do you have siblings? Yeah, I have a twin sister and I have a little brother. That's, that's fascinating to me because they initially saw you one way and now they, they see you another way. How has that been in, in relationship with them? Yeah, so um, initially before I realized I was trans, I came out as gay when I was really young. Like I was like 13 at the time. And at that time, my sister took it really, really well. Um, she, you know, she immediately accepted me, was very, very supportive. She even hid me from my parents <laughs> and, uh, you know, tried to uh, make up excuses for, for whenever I was missing. But um, 
at, when I came out as trans, it was different. So my sister actually didn't take it as well as my brother did. And when I look at it retrospectively, I really do think it's because we're twins. And so much of our identity growing up was us being the same, wearing the same clothes, doing the same things, us being praised together as one unit instead of two separate people. That when I made that decision to transition for her, it was like losing a part of herself because she identifies as a cisgender woman. But eventually, you know, she's 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 okay with it now. She's cool about it. She's happy for me. That's so interesting because, um, you know, that uh, bond between t- twins um, and how your sister felt like she was losing a part of herself. Whereas, how did it feel for you, the transition? For, yeah, for me, it was actually starting to become who I am. Yeah. That, that's so beautiful, right? And um, it for me, it's really interesting that we can be a lot of things in our head, but our bodies need to reflect who we are in a in a very profound way. I would love for you to to maybe try to take a deep dive into that. Can you repeat the question? So in our heads, we can be a lot of things, right? I can close my eyes and imagine everything from being a fairy to being, I don't know, a dwarf. And, um, but I'm not, and nor do I care to be outside Mm -hmm. of a fantasy world, right? Um, And so you knew for a long time you were trans and it was, you didn't feel that sense of completion until you, your body started to transition with you Mm -hmm. Um, and that connection between what's in our head and what we embody I think is very profound Um, and I'd love for you to take a deep dive into that yeah for me um, it's like you said it's not like oh I want to become Batman you know that's not a realistic yes I do want to be Batman I want to be cool like Batman but I'm not Batman but for me being realizing I'm trans is that when ever since I was really young, my parents say this all the time. It's like even before I had working memory, I would always prefer boys items. So my dad um, lived in the U.S. before we immigrated here and he would come back uh, to Bangladesh where I was born and bring toys and he would bring boys toys. I don't know why he did that because my brother wasn't born yet, but he would bring boys toys and girls toys. And for some reason, my my mom says this all the time, I always gravitated towards the toys that were specifically made for boys. I still didn't have a concept of what gender identity or gender is, but that's what I always ended up gravitating towards. And even growing up, my mom said like, all my behaviors was was something she would expect in a son, but not in a daughter. Um, And then as I got older and older, Every time I had dreams, I was a boy in my dreams. So it wasn't something that, like, you know, I desired to be. It was something that I already was in my head. Just a quick follow-up. You were already that in your head. And now take us to that testosterone injection and the beginning of medical transition. Um, Sort of the alignment of your body morphology and and everything with what was already clear in your head what was that like it at first it was kind of scary because I was like what is like am I ready for this you know am I ready for this change am I going to be who I really see myself as and now four years later I've been on testosterone for uh, four four years and one month now it's like little me would could never imagine this is what I look like and I am so happy at looking at myself in the mirror like this is what I saw myself growing up to be and I've achieved it that is so fascinating (laughs) to hear um when when we actualize ourselves when we actualize our dreams it's uh it's it's a feeling that is so can be so liberating um, I want to ask though um, about any because you mentioned earlier about being Batman or Mr. Atlas and so on. Um, but to be a, a bit more serious about that, to say 
uh, have there been any limitations or challenges um, as you transitioned and even now that that you find uh, that you're still working on uh, so that um, we paint a correct picture so that we do not kind of paint an, a picture that probably do not exist. So I just wanted you to kind of, if if you can share with us any particular challenges or limitations that you may still be working on. Yes, for, for me, I've taken my medical transition as pretty chill. Like I consider myself, I'll just roll with the punches of the changes that I'm experiencing. But like I've said, the first six months, I actually felt worse than before I started taking testosterone because I was just like, why is it taking so long for all these changes? I had, I wasn't growing facial hair. I wasn't gaining muscles. Uh, my voice was like in between um, more in the feminine range versus the masculine range. And I was just getting so, so frustrated. And I was like, oh my God, like, was this the right decision that I made? But after I hit that six months and went on to seven months, it was like the changes just skyrocketed. It's like I hit like this tipping point and then all of a sudden all these changes happened at once. And, you know, at first it was really hard to adjust to because when I saw myself in the mirror, I looked different every month. And then I had to buy new clothes every month too. So before I transitioned, I was like 90 pounds. I was a really scrawny person. Like <laughs> if you saw pictures of me from before, you'd be like, wow, you're a completely different person. And then I gained 50 pounds within the first two years of transitioning. So like my body has changed so much and I've had to kind of adjust a lot, um, even with like doctor's appointments, because before I had low blood pressure and now I have to watch my blood pressure. So I'm like, oh my God, I got to watch my sugars and my like cholesterol and not eat too much fatty foods. But when I was not transitioning, medically transitioning, uh, I had none of those issues. So it's been hard to adapt in a way where it can't comes to, you know, my, how my body has changed physically. Also uh, adjusting to the changes in libido has been uh, very interesting because testosterone does increase your libido. And um, there is a, there's a way like at first you don't really know how to manage that. And you have to kind of learn yourself on how, how to manage that. Um, and just, you know, even having romantic relationships has been different because of these changes. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that was, that gave me such a profound insight into um, what you have experienced over the last four years and one month of since your first testosterone shot. And I think we need to remember, not only were you going through these profound changes in your body and affirming your identity, but you were also going through medical school, which I hear is quite tough. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Medical school is rough. Um, I try to be honest with all the pre-med students who are like, I want to go to med school. I was like, just be, be, be wary of what you're signing up for. <laughs> uh, even, even to this day, um, I always joke about, man, maybe I should have done something else. But of course, I'm very passionate about medicine. I love what it is. But it, it is very, very difficult. And while I was transitioning, it was even more difficult because I had to deal with all these changes that were happening in my body, but also deal with the rapid change of curriculum that I had to absorb. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that's a lot of that's a lot for anyone to deal with. Where do you draw your strength from? to to deal with your own transition and to deal with the rigor of medical school and the activism and it's not just the hours in a day we spend with it it's also the emotional energy that goes into all of these things how do you manage it all it really has to do a lot with uh, as i've said before atlanta as a whole so atlanta is really been a super, super supportive community for me. While I was in medical school, I was also the only openly out trans person in my class. And there was a point where I just felt so alone. And I did have supportive classmates, but I just, I was just like yearning for someone similar to me. So I started going on Google and looking up if there's any out trans people here. And luckily enough, there was a trans activist. Her name is Faroza Saeed. And she's a Muslim transgender woman in Atlanta. She's very well known here. 
And um, I saw that she was attending this bisexual health conference. So I decided to go kind of stalked her a little bit, but um, we met there because we were the only two trans people uh, that are brown at that conference. And she introduced herself. She gave me her number. And then she um, introduced me to a whole community of South Asian, queer and trans people. And they've really been my chosen family the last four years. Um, Last month, uh, they they gave me a celebration of my four years on testosterone and even bought me this uh, engraved stethoscope. Um, So they've been really, really my backbone for fueling my, um, my passions in medicine and keeping me grounded. Amazing. And I remember seeing that uh, some pictures from that on Twitter uh, with the with the stethoscope. So um, really, really wonderful. We're going to post a couple of uh, links to resources for our listeners um, at at the bottom of the the podcast description um, so that people can click their way through some support in in their area. Um, You're in fourth year medical school. The match is coming up. Where's the road going? So I'm very interested in this specific specialty called combined internal med psychiatry or combined family med psychiatry. It's a five-year program. Uh, It's condensed internal medicine or family medicine with psychiatry. And by the end of it, you get double board certified in both specialties, which is exactly what I think I, the training I need to continue the work that I am doing. So what right now is my, my, my passion is looking at the nuances of transgender health, not just primary care for trans people, not just hormone replacement therapy for trans people, but what are the unique medical concerns we have for trans people? Uh, for example, there's two very small studies that have been published in the last five years that looked at trans youth and its relation to type one diabetes. And when they controlled with um, other kids who are not trans, who have type one diabetes, they saw that trans kids had a 30% more increased risk of developing type one diabetes. And there's no link behind that, but there is a theory that it's because of the stress response leading to autoimmunity. So these are like the nuances that I really wanna pursue and research and talk about uh, as a, a med psych practitioner. Wow, that's amazing. And um, all fingers crossed that it works out because the world needs you and the world needs you in that specialty. And uh, the in the world, I mean, not just your patients, which I assume will be mostly trans patients, but I think the entire medical community, the my entire medical education community and the community at large, I think uh, these issues are under-researched and um, so glad to hear that you're going to take that on. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I'm very passionate about representing non-generalizable populations in research. Thank you so much, Ben. That sounds like uh, I'm going to be following your progress and and just rooting for you as you um, as you go on to specialize. Um, uh, so as you round up this uh, body banter, we like to ask you a question we ask for, from all of our guests. What is your favorite body part? My favorite body part is the sternum. I did one month in trauma uh, down at Grady Hospital in Atlanta, and I swear the sternum saved so many lives just by itself, just doing its thing, being the one of the hardest bones that you know protect, it protects your heart, it protects your lungs. Um, it protects the ribs because the ribs are so fragile. Uh, so that's that's my favorite body part. I love that. I think that's the first time we've heard about the sternum as the favorite body part. <laughs> that's really wonderful. I'm going to now reevaluate my sternum and the way I talk about it. So I just talked about the sternum yesterday in lecture, and I regret not hearing this beforehand. So I might <laughs> go follow up in my next lecture about that. What's your least favorite body part? It's probably the knees because uh, the world, the universe gave us two and they still, for some reason, never work correctly. Once you hit a certain age, uh, you might need a replacement. I mean, it. I do squats and now my knees are not at, at its prime anymore. 
<laughs> true, true. It's like the trade-off of our stubborn upright gait. I think we need to have a body banter just on upright gait. It's <laughs> come up so many times that people's least favorite body part is related somehow to that. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, thanks for being our guest. Thank you for your openness and your vulnerability in um, answering our questions and sharing your embodied experience um, as a transmasculine mes- medical student. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your activism. And um, I really look forward, just like Shagan said, to to watching what you'll do to change the world. And I'm pretty sure you will. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And I want to end this with, you know, I'm not going to be the only trans person doing all this amazing work. Uh, my goal is to one day retire so someone else can pick this up, not just one person, but uh, a huge uh, team of not just trans people, but trans allies that are paving the way for making uh, medicine more equitable. Thank you. And I think one important step in that direction is telling these stories and being open about it and having as allies and an open mind and open heart to the stories um, and supporting everyone in that journey. So thanks for being part of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben, and uh, wish you all the best in your journey. Well, everyone, thank you so much. And uh, this has been another episode of Body Banter. Till next time, from me, goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time.